All right, once again, my name is Kevin Patterson and I am your guest speaker for the evening. Good to have everybody here. Appreciate your presence. Tonight is the culmination of everything we have been working toward this week. Talking about how the ark was constructed in days of great wickedness. Uh, what kind of man Noah was. We learned all about the animals last night. But what we are getting to the point of dealing with tonight is the actual flood. And so we're going to talk about that great cataclysm that hit our world so many centuries ago. And we're going to try to glean some things from this lesson, hopefully, that are not too scientific, but at the same time are things we need to know. If you are not the world's greatest English student, it doesn't mean you shouldn't study English. The better you speak, the better you communicate. If math is not your favorite subject, well, you still need to know whether you're being taken advantage of at the grocery store. And so you want, might want to make sure that you can add things and subtract things well. Make sure you're getting your appropriate discount. Make sure you're not being charged a premium. And science is the same thing. Science is not everybody's fun subject. Some people love it. I'm one of those people. But at the same time, others don't. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a scholar or hold some type of degree in education to appreciate some of the fundamentals of good science. Because if God created the natural laws of our planet, then God also created good science. The problem is that there is such a thing as bad science, and we have to refute that. I'll give you an example. For years and years and years and years and years, the people on the earth thought that the planet was flat. And unfortunately, some people still think that today. But we learned because of science, at, in a time, by the way, long before we were able to shoot men into space and look down on this marble called the earth, we were able to ascertain that the world is in fact round, that it's a sphere, by the way, just like the Old Testament said, hundreds and hundreds of years before it was ever discovered. And so there is a thing, a difference between good science and bad science, and that's kind of what we want to jump into today. I want to talk to you to begin with about something that is the groundwork of bad science. Last night we talked about creation versus evolution. We talked about theism versus atheism. Theism is the idea that there is a God, and creation is the result of the six days of supernatural invention, creation by that God. Atheism, A means not, so no theism, no God. Atheism is the belief that there is no God, and so since everything exists and we're here, where did we come from? And so atheistic evolution says that everything blew into existence out of nothing, which by the way science says you can't do. And then you had things that evolved from one kind to another kind, which by the way science says you can't do. And ultimately billions of years later we are who we are where we are today, whereas the Bible says all of this actually happened just a few thousand years ago. Uniformitarianism is a word, and if you look at that definition up there, it says, all things continue today as they have from the beginning. If you knew nothing more about this big giant word, you probably would say, yeah, that sounds good, because it rains like it used to rain, and it snows like it used to snow, and animals reproduce like they used to reproduce, but no, 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 no. What they're saying is uniformitarianism says that everything has always been the same. It is the groundwork for everything that is atheistic evolution. It is what they rely upon to say that over millions and billions of years these things evolved. There were no 
great uh, catastrophes or no, no great moments of creation. Uh, it just kind of over time slowly and surely evolved into what it is today. I want you to consider something that Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. And it's a very interesting passage of Scripture. And I'm going to read it first and then I want to take a closer look at it. It reads, For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the Word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. It's interesting that science cannot explain the two great events in human history, the creation and the flood. And Peter talks about both of them. And who was there for both of them? God was. Who was there in the beginning with God when He created everything? Well, you can't even claim Adam and Eve until day six. And then what about the flood? Who is there to give witness to the flood? Well, only ultimately Noah and his family because everyone else perished in the flood. I was talking to somebody on the phone the other day, a little statistic that I was noticing from one of the posters in the building next door, and it was talking about the ages of all these people and from Noah down the line. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Abraham, who would ultimately give rise to Isaac and Jacob and the Israelite nation and, and the Jews of today, it's, it's interesting that according to the timeline According to the chronologies of these generations, Abraham was alive and a young man when Noah was still alive. Many generations later, Noah lives to be 950 years old, so he's still alive when Abraham is born and grows into a young man, meaning that it's possible, we don't have any evidence of this, but it's possible that Abraham could have gotten firsthand knowledge and accounting of the flood from the man who built the boat and survived it. Well, Peter just basically makes the point here that these things did not exist over natural means over billions of years. These things came about by the Word of God. A being, the only God who is omnipotent, all-powerful. The very utterance of a word can bring something into existence that never existed before. I want us to take a look at the evidence tonight for the flood. That's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about. And the very first thing that we're going to talk about, because it's the most important place for we as believers to go, is the Bible itself. We need to go to the Word of God in order to establish just exactly what happened. Because again, we're actually listening to the words of the one who was present for all of the things we've been talking about. Who caused all of these things we've been talking about. So let's take a look at the evidence from a biblical history standpoint. And we're going to take a look at seven different things in this, this particular part of our study tonight. First of all, let's talk about the fountains. The fountains that caused the flood according to Scripture. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 we read, "...on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up." We don't have any pictures. We don't have any further explanation. We just understand that the fountains of the deep were broken up. Now what exactly does that mean? Well, from a biblical standpoint, a little hard for us to gather more than what's there. But one of the things that I've always talked about is the idea that the Bible talks about not only here but elsewhere, that there are uh, fountains from the deep, there are rivers from the deep, there are bodies of water that don't just flow horizontally, but they flow vertically. And so it is true, out in the middle of the ocean, there are areas in these vast deposits of salt water where fresh water exists. Because there are literal rivers of fresh water that come up from below. And they come up with, in such volume, in such force, that they literally part the salt water away from them. And there are these places in different parts of the world. Where right in the middle of salt water you can reach over the side and grab a drink and be fine. 
Well, uh, I want you to think about this back in the days of Noah. Not just a few little rivers, but all of the fountains of the great deep were broken up. We're going to talk more about this on the scientific side in a little bit and what might have happened and what this might mean. But we're talking about a massive amount of water that's not coming from the rains above, but are actually coming from the earth below. Then we talk about the windows of the heaven were opened. The idea in Genesis 7 and verse 11 that the rain started to come down. Now I want you to think about this for just a second. You know as well as I do where we live right here, most days you look up in the sky and you see blue sky. If we see blue sky, we know no rain. If we see clouds, we know the possibility of rain. If we see dark clouds and lightning, then we know maybe a great probability for rain. But there's no place on the planet where there are clouds everywhere. And if it did, how long would it take that rain to, to fall before it was exhausted? There was something else. There was something more. And what that means, we're not at all sure as far as drawing a conclusion. Uh, but there are theories uh, that there was a, a vast amount of water, almost like a canopy of water around the earth at that time. Maybe that's the explanation for the age of men. Maybe this canopy was able to filter out so many of the harmful rays from the sun that are present for us today. And so maybe that had something to do with their strength and the longevity of their lives and things like that. But whatever the case, not only do we have water pouring up from below, but we now have water pouring down from above. And the Bible says that occurred for 40 solid days, 40 days and 40 nights. Number three, the Bible talks about the increase of water. The waters increased and prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Now that's parts of three different verses. Genesis 7, 17, 18, and 24. I want you to consider something that I said a few weeks in our live stream. I want you to consider this idea of how much water would that be. Because of where we live here in Florida, we understand what it means to go through a hurricane. We've gone through little hurricanes, we've gone through bigger hurricanes. But the bottom line is, a hurricane for the most part is going to bring water to us over the course of maybe 24 or maybe with a slow moving storm, 48 hours. I don't know if y'all remember the hurricane that just came over the Bahamas, Grand Bahama Island, uh, just a few years ago, and it just seemed to just stall right on top of them. And it just dumped tremendous amount of waters for about 48 hours. Well, it, it was a terrible thing for them, but I want you all to think about what we understand. If it rains solidly and hard for 24 hours, what does that bring just to our little neck of the woods? Well, it brings a lot of rain. Uh, I'm sitting there watching Darlene smile, and I'm thinking about because she's right across the street from us. They're built up on a, a little bit of a hill. We're built up on a little bit of a hill, but the neighbors right across the street and to, my, to our, our next door neighbor, they have a yard that floods every time. And it's kind of funny to think about flooding because I always tell people we don't have mud puddles in Florida because we're on a big giant sandbar. And in a normal afternoon rainstorm, that's about right. It rains for 20 minutes, and then 20 minutes later it's gone. But when you have so much rain in a hurricane that it just dumps solidly for 24 hours, even Florida floods. Even Florida has floods. And so I've driven down our road, not because I should have, but because I did. I've driven down our neighborhood roads when I couldn't see the road. I'm in a truck, so I'm all right, but I couldn't see the road because it was flooded over. That's one day. What would it mean to our little town if it rained for 40 days and 40 nights? Well, the, the waters would increase and increase and prevail and greatly increase, and uh, they would prevail on the earth uh, much deeper than any of us would want. We'd probably try to find escape even here, but if it was happening everywhere, where would we escape to? Consider number four. This is the scope of the flood. You see there are a lot of critics of the Bible. Some of those that I mentioned to you last night that try to have this hybrid 
position. They're not fully creationists, but they're not fully evolutionists. They are theistic evolutionists. They try to take bits and pieces of both and add them together. And so, one of their great proponents made the statement a number of years ago, he said that the flood of the Bible did exist, but it was just a regional flood. It just happened over in the Middle East somewhere, and, and it was devastating for that area, but it didn't affect any other part of the planet. Well, I want you to consider for just a second, why build an ark? Why would you build an ark? You know, Genesis 5:32 and chapter 7, verse 6 ultimately talks about, as we've talked about over the last few nights, it was this for the salvation of Noah and his family, for the salvation of the animals, for uh, the world to be able to begin again after the flood. But ultimately, it is to escape water. Now, I want you to think about this. Why send the animals to Noah? In Genesis 6, verses 19 and 20, when God brings the animals to Noah, why not just bring them to higher ground? Why build the boat in the first place if all you have to do is move to higher ground? Because remember, the Bible says even the highest of ground was covered in water. How could the water cover the mountains? Genesis 7:19. And the Bible says it covered it by about 15 cubits. So, whatever the highest mountain was, that's another maybe, maybe we theorize maybe another 22 and a half feet. How could the water cover the mountains? Well, let's be clear about something. The tallest mountain range are the Himalayas today. And the tallest mountain in the Himalayas is what? What is it? Mount Everest. Mount Everest stands over 29,000 feet above sea level. Nobody says that Mount Everest existed before the flood. If it did, I still have no problem with this because if you consider all the water coming from everywhere, that's really not hard to fathom. Uh, but the mountains may have been much lower prior to the flood. When we get into the scientific side of this later, you might understand why. But the bottom line is when you've got water coming for 40 days and 40 nights solid like we would experience maybe the worst hurricane imaginable and it's just coming from everywhere, it would be very easy to understand that it would cover those mountains. And as I have pointed out before, even if the mountains were separated by distance, water always flows down. It always finds that path of least resistance and goes down. And so the bottom line is, if it's covering a mountain over here, it's not going to not cover a mountain over here. Why? Because if you've got enough water to cover this mountain here, then you're going to have enough water to cover that mountain there. Ultimately, is God a liar? I, because this is the time when I'm usually speaking in my live stream, I videotaped that this morning. And we talked about Genesis 9. And we talked about ultimately the promise, the sign of the covenant. And what was that? That was a rainbow in the clouds. He says he'll never again do this. But it, if this didn't happen, then that makes God out to be a liar. Or if it's going to happen again, that makes God out to be a liar. But the Bible says that God cannot lie. God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 and verse 5. So the idea is not only does God choose not to sin, that's really not an apt description. God cannot sin because there's nothing in Him that responds to sin. What about the subsiding after the flood? The water subsided in Genesis 8, 1 through 3. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. So everything that God broke open, He then closed. What He brought about, He brought to an end. And it was restrained. Ultimately, the Bible teaches, number six, the forming of the mountains. Psalm 104 verses 6 through 9 says a lot more than this little snippet that is on our screen, but the mountains rose, the valleys sank, down to the place that you appointed for them. Ultimately, if we consider what the world went through in this great cataclysm, what we realize is that whatever mountains existed before were probably much higher afterward. 
Whatever valleys existed before were probably much deeper afterward. And we have places in the uh, ocean, uh, you know, some of these trenches uh, that go down miles and miles and miles. In fact, they are so deep that you can take that 29,000 foot peak called Mount Everest, turn it upside down, drop it into that trench, and it still will not hit bottom. When it hits bottom, the entire mountain itself would be underwater. And so, we see a great change that takes place. Now, God in the beginning created everything and then He moved it into the shape that He wanted it to be in. But then the flood came about and that shape changed. Why? Because one of the most destructive forces on the planet is water. We bathe in it, we wash our hands, we drink it, we don't think much about it. But water in volume, water in mass is power. Think about all those hydroelectric dams, those hydroelectric plants that we have. They can generate all of this electricity because of the power of water. Well, there was this ability, but the world changed during this time. And then we see the formation of boundaries. Psalm 104 verse 9 in particular reads, You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. This goes back to Genesis 9. Not only did God give us His Word when He formed that covenant with both man and animals, by the way. He said, to all of the things that came off of the ark, I make to you this covenant, I'll never again destroy the world by flood. This is that point. It's not just His Word, but there is a boundary. Uh, he has prevented the rain from above from ever doing that again. And so we're left with what we understand. He has prevented the rivers from below from ever bursting forth and flooding the world again. And so, no matter what climatologists say that everything's going to be underwater in a few years like that, God says no. That's not going to be the case. Waters might rise and waters might fall, but He will never again destroy the world and the life that is on it by flood. Now remember, He will destroy the world. There will be a time when He will destroy this world by fire. And that is on that last and final great day called the Day of Judgment, where we will stand before our Creator and give an account of how we've lived our lives. The world at that point in time will be done, but it won't be because of a flood of water. Now let's jump into the scientific stuff and realize that, again, not a one of us were there. So some of this is our own hypothesis and some of this is our own theory. But the question is, since God cannot lie, we have to make sure that what we believe from a scientific standpoint aligns with God's Word. <clears throat> science can lie if it's bad science. Good science simply reflects what God's already said. And we sometimes have to have wisdom and discernment to be able to know the difference between the two. So let's take a look at some of the evidence. If you remember back in geology, <laughs> and that was one of my freshman classes in college, it was nicknamed Rocks for Jocks. And so, it was where a lot of our football players uh, went to get an easy credit out of the way because basically if you went and sat down and listened to the lecture you'd get an A at the end of the course. So, uh, Rocks for Jocks was what it was called. I can't say that I learned a great deal in that class. Uh, because although I was not an athlete on the co collegiate level, uh, I probably didn't listen much better than some of them did. But I do remember that there are different kinds of rocks. Uh, there is a rock called an igneous rock. There's a rock called a metamorphic rock. And then there is sedimentary rock. And sedimentary rock is what I want you to under talk about right now because if you were to ask somebody how much, what kind of rock kind of covers the surface of the earth, uh, most people might guess one of these types of rocks. But you might be surprised to learn that between 80 and 90 percent of the surface of the earth is covered in sedimentary rock. And if you take a look at this picture, you'll see that's because there are different sedimentary layers. 
And the principle behind sedimentary rock is if you take a whole bunch of rock and you put it in a, a container and you stir all these different kinds of rock all the way up from big boulders to sand and things like that, a lot of times what you'll see is the heaviest stuff settles first. And then the lighter stuff settles on top of that, and the lighter stuff settles on top of that. And if you could, after everything settles, if you could strip away the container, you could see the different layers of that rock. That is sedimentary rock. And what's interesting is a lot of people who believe in atheistic evolution, they believe that these sediments are actually moments in time. Each sediment maybe represents a hundred million years or something like that. And as you go up the geologic column, then you, you can just say, well, there's a hundred thousand or a hundred million years, and there's a hundred million years, and by the way, this one was five hundred million years, and this one was a billion years. And they look at that as if that's just normal. When in fact, that's not how sedimentary rock is developed. Something had to lay it down in those deposits. And what we find is most of North America uh, is like this. You can see this. If you go out to California, or uh, if you go out to uh, the Grand Canyon, you can see this kind of thing. Number two, marine fossils. Now, we understand what a fossil is. All of us have gone out to a quarry or just on the beach sometimes, and you pick up a rock or something like that, and you'll see a little shell indentation in it. And that's typically where some kind of animal or some kind of life form uh, was pressed between two hard objects or maybe a couple of malleable objects at the time. And then over time, the animal itself kind of dissolved away, decomposed, but it was left with this impression which becomes very hard and ultimately we call a fossil. Now you've seen big fossils and you've seen little fossils. We've talked about uh, with the study of the dinosaurs last night, you know, we've gotten some amazing fossils of some pretty big animals. But I want you to consider this for just a second. Why would you find marine or ocean going fossils in the middle of continents or up on tops or the sides of some mountains. Why would you do that? Why would you find ocean remains in areas where there are no oceans today? Unless at some point in time those areas were covered by water. So I used to live in Kansas many years ago. You know what they found in the middle of Kansas? And if you don't know where Kansas is, let me just be clear, it's in the middle of the United States. Okay, if you were really lousy at geography in high school, it's in the middle of the United States. Nowhere near salt water. The closest salt water might be Salt Lake uh, in, in Utah, but it doesn't have this kind of animal life. They have found not only fossils, in Kansas. Not only marine fossils, they found shark fossils in Kansas. How in the world did a shark get into Kansas? <laughs> Unless at one point in time there was water that covered that and allowed those animals to exist there. Question number two. How is it that you can find marine fossils? Little animals, little things that maybe live in little shells or something like that on the sides of great mountains. That right there is a picture of the Himalayas. And they have, not necessarily at the very top of the Himalayas, uh, it, it's very hard to even be at the top of the Himalayas. Lack of oxygen, the bitter, bitter cold, people have died. This year alone is setting a record for the most number of people to have died on top of Mount Everest. You don't go and have geological digs on the top of Mount Everest or high up in the Himalayas. But as high up as they can reasonably go to this, the largest or the highest mountain chain in the world, they have found fossils of animal life, very specifically ocean animal life. How in the world do you have little critters that swim around in the ocean finding their way up the side of the Himalayas? Unless at some point in time that land was covered in water. If you were to look at this up close you might get really lost. I was considering not including this 
in the lesson tonight. But I, I want you to try to, and I realize it's a little hard for you to see, but I want you to picture what you might recognize as something that is atheistically evolutionary. In other words, this is what a lot of the scientists of the world would draw up. But this is actually not drawn up by the scientists of the world who do not believe in a God. This is actually drawn up by people who believe in God. And what they're saying is, in those sediments of time, you start to see various fossils. And, okay, that's fine. That's what people do today. In fact, science actually does a very good job. Even the atheistic scientists do a fairly good job of saying, okay, these critters are found down here, and these critters were found in here, and these critters were found. Now, every once in a while they find an animal that's crossed over. They find a fossil in an area it's not supposed to be in. But generally speaking, this information is much like what you might see in any scientific textbook. But what's over here is not only the Precambrian period and the Paleozoic period and the Mesozoic period and the Cenozoic period, but you'll notice that it's TVA or TYA, which stands for thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago, not billions of years ago. What they've said is everything that you find in the geological column is actually explained for us in Scripture. It actually makes a lot of sense if you consider the existence of the flood. And if you look down here on this bottom level, this pre-Cambrian level, if you consider some of the things that were maybe at the earliest time, you wouldn't find a whole lot of fossils. But pre-Cambrian moves into post-Cambrian. And that's where we have a problem. That's where science, bad science, atheistic evolution has a problem. Because all of a sudden there's this explosion of life that is buried and fossilized in the sediments. Now I want you to consider something for just a moment. If in fact the flood of the Bible occurred, then what predictions can we make that would reasonably and rationally coincide with what we found in the geologic columns. Okay, well first of all, we can consider this. Very few fossils were formed before the flood. Why would we say that? Okay, because remember that fossils have to be in between things and have to be packed down into things. So for instance, if an animal dies on the side of the highway, does that animal, assuming that nobody from around here picks it up and goes home and eats it, uh, Assuming that doesn't happen, what's going to happen to that animal? Will it fossilize? No, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to rot. It's going to get eaten by the vultures. It's never going to make it anywhere where it can be packed in. Now, let's say if an animal is on the side of a hill and there's a mudslide, okay? Now might it fossilize? Once you entomb it in mud and debris and in sediment and you remove the oxygen from it and the ability of other critters other than the worms from helping it to decompose. And by the way, if they, those worms come in there, they're going to help eat the flesh, but the skeleton's still going to be there. And then the other sediment's going to work in there, the other mud's going to work in there. What's going to be left? You're going to have a fossil of a being that once existed. Okay, that makes sense. So at a time before a flood, it would make sense that very few fossils were formed. That's that lowest pre-Cambrian level. But then you have this post-Cambrian period where all of these fossils exist. And what's interesting is there are no transitional fossils in that area. In other words, if things happened over thousands of years and at one particular moment in time where there was this great catastrophic flood, then transitional fossils would not exist. In other words, an animal that's evolving from this animal to this animal, if true evolution existed, then you'd have the transitional animal in between the two. But as true evolution, atheistic evolution does not exist, then there would be no transitional fossils, and guess how many they found? Not a one. 
you understand they're still looking for the missing link. You heard that? Between apes and humans? Atheistic evolution says we came from apes. Bible says no we didn't. We were created on the very same day as the apes. Which is why there is no missing link. Here's another prediction. If the flood of the Bible is true, living creatures would be fully formed and functional when they first appear. And guess what? That's exactly right. Many of the things on the earliest levels of that sediment, much less the latest levels of the sediment, those animals still exist. And the ones that don't exist are animals that have gone extinct. But there is nothing that demonstrates that they are in the process of evolving. They're already living, fully functional creatures. And another prediction is a significant marker would be present in the geologic column to represent the flood's beginning. In other words, there's some earth that was always at the bottom. If you have a whole bunch of water, it's got to be on something. So there was some level of earth that always existed before the flood deposited all of these sedimentary layers. And an explosion of fully formed fossils would be found above that marker, demonstrating the deposits of all of the animals that were destroyed in the flood. Right here you have a picture of some uh, areas over in the Grand Canyon. And if you'll notice over here it says the great unconformity is highlighted by the yellow lines in each picture. What in the world is the great unconformity? Well first of all think about that last word unconformity. If we talk about conformity it means going along with everything. The reason this is the great unconformity is because that's what atheistic evolutionists have named it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't go along with everything else they think. They think that everything down here should work the same as everything up here. But do you notice what's down here? Big solid chunks of rock and all of a sudden on top of it is all of this sedimentary soil. All of these different layers of deposits. And this is the case throughout the world. It's not just here in North America. It's not just in Europe. It's not just in Asia. These are areas all around. And this great line of unconformity exists everywhere. And they can't figure out without acknowledging the flood of the Bible why that line's there. By the way, just to be clear, when you go to the Grand Canyon you'll not actually see a yellow line. So I do, do want to make sure we're clear on that. But that line is drawn so that you can understand that a little bit better. Let's take a look at a biblical interpretation of the scientific evidence for the flood. If you were to look at the earth it would be like looking at a peach. If you've ever cut a peach open, you know, you'll notice that seed there in the middle that you definitely don't want to be chomping on. And then you'll have the meat around the seed, and then you have the skin around. And some people eat the skin, some people don't. But the bottom line is that's very much how, like how the earth is made. The earth has a core in the center. And if you were to compare that to the peach pit, well, the peach pit has an inner core and an outer core, okay? None of it you want to eat. <laughs> but uh, we have an inner and outer core at the center of our planet. Then we have what we would call the meat of the peach. We have a big thick area in between that and the outer core, or the outer crust, called the mantle. And then the crust would be equivalent to the peel. Now the crust is miles deep, but compared to the size of our planet it's nothing. It's nothing in comparison. Now why do we bring this up? Because think about us right now. We live on the crust. We live in comfortable temperatures. We live in, in a time and a place that, ex that yeah, I know y'all are laughing going, yeah this is Florida and recently the temperatures have not been comfortable at all. But uh, they're not 2,000 degrees is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, but uh, if you think about this we can exist here. We could not exist in the mantle. We could not exist in the core. Because parts of those areas are molten lava. 
It's just incredibly hot. That's where we get thermal heat. Uh, that's where we get a lot. You know, you realize that people will sometimes live on the surface of the planet and they'll die from exposure from snow or rain or things like that. But you realize if they can dig a hole about six feet down in there and get down into that, they'll actually, even in the middle of the coldest places, receive some of that thermal warmth from below. Well, that's what we're talking about. Now, let me ask you something. What if the mantle were to break up, break forward through the crust? What would happen? I want you to consider something. Is this what it means when we talk about not the floodgates from ab above, but the, the areas from below burst forth? First of all, what would cause it to burst forth? Obviously, if God wants something to burst, He'll cause it to burst. But how might He have done that? Could that thermal energy, could that heat, could that pressure, could He have allowed that to become so great that it broke forth? And I want you to consider, if it did break forth, if the mantle broke through the crust, what would happen if all that magma is spilling out into the oceans, for instance, that existed at that time? Several things are going to happen. Number one, it's going to raise the level of the bottom of the ocean. Number two, a lot of that is going to vent forth. It's going to vent forth through the top of the water level into steam, putting more water into the air, allowing more rain to come down. And if it bursts forth, what's going to happen to these ocean plates, these cold ocean plates and these continents? They're going to be raised. Think about what might happen uh, to the land itself. Might hills that are this tall turn into mountains that are this tall? And if that's indeed the case, if those mountains are raised and those plates, which you've heard probably from junior high, plate tectonics, if those plates are lifted up, then the back end of those plates drop down. Well, isn't that what the Bible said? He made the mountains higher and the valleys lower. I want you to consider this. If we consider this magma coming up into the ocean and bursting forth from above, geologists and geophysicists estimate that at its peak height, the ocean floor would have been over 3,000 feet higher than its initial level. Somebody says, was there enough water to do the damage that it was done? We're not even talking about rain. We're just talking about this. If you were to raise the ocean over a half a mile high, what would that do? People are worried right now because New York has an extra two inches of rain, you know, or has an extra two inches on its water level or something like that. Oh, we're all going to flood. Well, try raising it over a half a mile and see how you like it. And then consider all of the other rain that's coming along with it, all of the other water that's being added to the mix. It was a great catastrophe, the flood of the ark was. Well, we're just about out of time, but we need to make this important point. What's the spiritual importance of the flood? Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39 reads, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. If we understand this particular passage in Matthew 24 to be in reference to the second coming of Christ, and there is discussion about that, but I'm just going to say that makes perfectly good sense. Because Matthew 25 talks about being prepared for such an event. Remember the people who are the, the wise virgins and the foolish virgins? The wise virgins were ready for the bridegroom to come, but the foolish virgins got locked out. They were not granted entrance to the celebration. Well, that's the same thing. You know, whether people saw rain or not before the flood's immaterial, I guarantee you they were real interested in that ark when that rain got about ankle deep and then knee deep, and then waist deep, and right here. I bet they were real interested in getting on the boat whose door had already been shut. Consider this, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. 
Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? 2 Peter 3, verses 10 and 11. I want you to think about that. We've, we read several passages of Scripture that talk about the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night because you're not prepared for a thief. And that is a reflection of those who are not preparing for the coming of the Lord. But there were eight people who were saved in the flood. Why? Because they prepared for the coming of the water and they were saved in an ark. The church not the thing that most people think about. They don't understand what that is. The body of Christ. The family of God. But the Lord's church is that very same comparable vehicle. If we're not on board, we're not going to make it to salvation. But if we are members of His church, not some man-made religious institution, but if we are on board with Christ, then we have that hope of eternal life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, one of the most relevant passages of Scripture in the New Testament because it literally describes Noah and the ark in the verses before and then makes a comparison to this. But it says, The divine, or God, long-suffering, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, or a comparison which now saves us. And Peter describes that as baptism. It's not more important than faith. It's not more important than repentance. It's not more important than confession. But you can't say it's not important. Because the Bible says baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does baptism now save us? It's because that is the vessel. That is the vehicle that God chooses for us today to come in contact with the blood of Christ. Is the water anything special? No, it's no more special than in the days of Noah. But the very flood, the very water that condemned the world saved Noah and his family. And the very water today of baptism that some people say, I don't want to do that, or that's a works only mentality, or blah, blah, blah. Every excuse under the sun that they say, I'm not going to get on board is the very thing that's going to prevent them from coming in contact with the cleansing and forgiving blood of Jesus. And if that happens, there will be no salvation for that person. So consider for just a moment the flood. A real event, provable in Scripture and provable scientifically. And trust me, we've just scratched the surface of the evidence. But it's there. And if you happen to find yourself in a discussion with somebody who does not believe in God or does not believe that the Bible is His Word or does not believe in the biblical account of the flood, learn your Bible so you can defend the truth. And learn a little science because you might find that it will go a long way toward helping you reason with some who are very unreasonable. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, thank You so very much for this evening, for this time where we can come together and study Your Word. Father, we pray that we have been faithful to it. We pray that we have been open and honest with the evidence, both inter internally to Your Word and externally according to the science that You gave us when You created this physical realm. Father, we pray that we will always be loyal to You and loyal to Your will for our lives. And Father, help us to come in contact with Your Son's blood. Father, help us to be faithful and to be immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit so that we can rise to walk in newness of life. Father, we pray Your blessings upon us. Bless us as we get ready to not only end this day but to conclude this week-long series of studies. Father, we pray that as adults we have gained a lot. And Father, we pray as our young people have gained a lot as well. Thank you for all those who helped to uh, put together this program. And Father, we pray that it has been according to your will and all has been done to your pleasure. Father, we thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. And we believe. 
what you say. Bless us and keep us in Christ's name. Amen.